By the time we catch up with Jacob, now in Genesis chapter 30, he has been serving his cousin Laban for 14 years. Seven years he served to gain what he thought would be Rachel, his wife. Instead, he received her older sister, Leah. And then seven more years he served Laban to get Rachel. And because Jacob was serving Laban and God was blessing Jacob, Laban's possessions increased and increased and increased. Laban had to recognize that, and Jacob knew it too. But now it was time for Jacob to provide for his own household. So Laban strikes a deal with Jacob. He doesn't want to let him go. So he says, all right, let's strike a deal. What should, what should your wages be? All right, Jacob says, look, I don't need, want anything for free. Let the speckled or the spotted or the flock with the patterns be mine and the ones without the patterns be yours. Laban said, good. And then the very next day, he gives all of the patterned ones to his sons out of reach of Jacob. So, Jacob, the deceiver, the conniver, the heel grabber, was deceived by Laban. Apparently, Laban did this many times with Jacob, tricked him a bunch of times to gain advantage of him. Well, Jacob employs a method. He gets these rods. He, he puts patterns. Basically, he puts patterns in front of a sheep so that the sheep would bear sheep with patterns. Apparently, Jacob thought that if you put patterns in front of the sheep when they are breeding, their babies, the lambs, would, be, would have patterns too. He thought that there was a causal correlation between the, what they see and the sheep that they bear. So when the strong ones were breeding, he, put, he would put up the patterns so that they would have patterned babies. And when the weak ones were breeding, he would take the patterns away. So that the ones, with, the ones that were born without the patterns would be Laban's, the weak ones, and the strong ones with the patterns would be his own. Okay? Let's read that together. Verse 41. Whenever the stronger of the flock were breeding, Jacob would lay the sticks in the troughs before the eyes of the flock that they might breed among the sticks. But for the feebler of the flock, he would not lay them there. So the feebler would be Laban's, and the stronger... Jacob's. Thus the man increased greatly and had large flocks, female servants, male servants, and camels and donkeys. Wow! Powerful sticks! Powerful patterns. Really? I think that's the, that's the reaction that, that's, that this story is supposed to elicit. What? <laughs> What's going on? That's how we are supposed to respond. There's no way that the sheep would increase uh, with patterns. I mean, there's no correlation. What the sheep see and what they bear, uh, that doesn't make any sense. That's the point. You see, Jacob was increasing. And Jacob was becoming a man of means with male and female servants and camels and donkeys how? By the blessing of God, in spite of Jacob's plans and, and schemes and his panicking, in spite of all of that, God was blessing Jacob. That's the point. It's not that God blessed Jacob because he put the sticks in front of the flocks. No. It's not because of that. It's in spite of the fact that Jacob was leaning on his own strength, leaning on his own intellect, trying to out-trick Laban. <clears throat> but Jacob already knew, and so did Laban. He knew too that it was through the blessing of God. See verse 27. But Laban said to him, If I have found favor in your sight, I have learned by divination that the Lord has blessed me because of you. You see, Laban recognized it. Name your wages, I will give it. Jacob said to him, you yourselves know how I have served you and how your livestock has fared with me. For you had little before I came and it has increased abundantly and the Lord has blessed you wherever I turned. Right? 
So both Jacob and Laban are understanding that at core and all throughout, it is through God's blessing that Jacob was being blessed. And that this was an indication that God would be faithful to Jacob to bring about his promises, his redemptive historical promises of sending the Messiah through him. God's sovereignty reigns and rules. And how different from Jesus, where you see throughout his life, he is never making haste. He's never hasty. He, he's always on the move, but never in a hurry. And he's always the picture of calm. Somebody said, Jesus is cool. But what kind of coolness did Jesus have? The kind that everybody recognizes and appreciates, you know, that's a cool kid. No. Jesus' cool was a faith coolness because of his reliance on the Heavenly Father, because of his following the Father's directions, the Holy Spirit's leading. He was always the picture of calm, the peace, the heavenly peace that Jesus then gave to his disciples. Yep. In Isaiah 28, there is, this, there is this phrase that I love, that those who trust in the Lord will not make haste. They won't be hasty. And it is wisdom to, to know that when you are pressurized, when you are under in a pressurized situation, and there are circumstances beyond your control, and your emotions are just turning over inside of you, that's the worst place to make life-altering decisions. But that's what we do, don't we? We tend to make choices in panic. But that's not a picture of what the child of God who follows in Jesus' cool footsteps are supposed to live. You know what this lived out looks like? Instead of relying on our own plans, schemes, intellect, panicking. This is how we ought to live our lives. It's one of my favorite passages. It's in Philippians chapter 4. I just wanted to share it with you. Verse 6. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, through prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Here's the promise. And the peace of God that passes all understanding will guard your hearts and minds. When you are tempted to despair, when you worry about your future, take, a, take it as an opportunity to lay it down. Thank the Lord that he is in control even of this and that he is turning it around for his glory and your good. Trust in this and plead for and experience the peace of God that passes all understanding, passes the understanding of the onlookers. How can you be at such peace in these kinds of circumstances? Let them ask. And let it even pass your own understanding. Whereas in the past, you would have panicked in the face of these kinds of trials. Yet, you are the picture of calm. Because you know who is in control. The one who raised Jesus from the dead, the one who sent the Holy Spirit to live with you now, is the same one that causes all thing to, things to work together for his glory and your good. Let's thank him. Let's lay down all of our worries before him and plead for and experience the peace of God that passes all understanding, which peace Jesus says he gives to us, not as the world gives. The peace that the world also cannot take away. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we look at Jacob's life and how he is always panicking. <laughs> and he is doing everything that he can to make sure that he has success using all kinds of methods that are not pleasing to you as well when you have 
promised success, when you have promised to bless. And we see Jesus, who trusting in your promise, who is the fulfillment of the promises given to Jacob. Through Jesus, all the nations are blessed right now. We see him and how faithful you are to him and to us. Then we who are hidden in him, Lord, lead us to be free of worry, as Jesus commanded us in the Sermon on the Mount. And to experience the peace of God that the world seeks for but cannot find, that can only be found in your sovereign provision. Lord, we want to rest. We want to rest here in your shelter for a little while. How easily shaken we are. We look to Jesus and the peace that only he can provide and has provided. I pray for that brother, that sister right now, going through circumstances completely beyond their control. Let them lead, let them lean with their whole weight on the one who is in control, namely you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Those days are gone. 